At the end of the day, the reason why I invest in real estate, because I want to eat forever, right? I never want to have to rely on another man to put food on my table. And that's what I learned working at Corporate America, that at any moment, they literally can just pull the plug and say, you know what? Your time is up. Here's a box. Pack up your stuff. You have 15 minutes to you know, exit the building. Here's a security guard that can take you on out of here. If I could find something that provided cash flow without me having to trade my time for money, that's where I wanted to be. That's when I say, you know what? I got to get some real estate. It has to work or it has to work. Welcome to an episode of Circle of Greatness. I get to bring back somebody I already had on a podcast. This is a brother of mine, a great friend, actually the person who actually introduced me to real estate, right? So I said, I got to bring him back on a podcast because the amount of lives and the receipts he had for helping other people get wealthy with real estate, I don't know too many people who can compare. Without further ado, y'all, I want to bring on entrepreneur, real estate developer, husband, all around amazing dude, and one of my partners, Doug Depp. What up, my guy? My man, thanks for having me on the podcast, Hello, brother. Yo, bro. Hey, yeah. your last one went crazy, so I said, <laughs> man, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta bring you back on because sure. things are changing, yep. the industry is changing, and I just want more people to know, like, wealth is important. Like, creating it now is like you're. The, I, I tell you this all the time. Is yeah. like. You know, I've always been on business, just how do we make money faster? Like, how do I get like things that, like di when, with digital real estate, you know, income can come a lot quicker. With right. a lot of various businesses, income can come quicker, but you changed my mindset to really think long-term. This is what made me want to start. That's why I'm invested in multiple apartment buildings, investing in single families, investing in event spaces, just things that can pay me know that I don't have to necessarily work for so yeah. again I appreciate you adjusting sure. my, my mind to make me really see that some of the properties you got now been paying you for the last 10 years and will continue to pay you for the rest of your existence so I was like yeah I definitely yeah I mean at the end of the day it comes down to playing the wealth game and setting those things up for the long term oftentimes we're out here we're just thinking short term like okay yeah. how much can I make this month this week but when we play in the long game, it's a different strategy, right? We want to make sure that we have cash flow coming in for you know, years and years to come. But also we're able to pass it down generations. But one of the beautiful things about real estate, it's, it's a true way to build your wealth, yeah. right? So what I mean by that is I've had properties for over 10 years, wow. right? And the tenants have been paying those properties down. So it's building up equity every single year that those tenants are in place, paying those properties down. So now at any time I can tap into that equity, or continue to let those tenants pay it down and then come to a, a situation where, all right, if I want to refinance the property, I can pull out all the capital and then restart the clock. Yeah. So that, so when, you, when you're playing this wealth game, you always have access to capital, yeah. which is a beautiful thing. And, yeah. you, and I see it as individual retirement buckets. Yeah, it's almost like, and you told me that, you like, bro, I tell people, a lot of people signed up for the 40-40 plan. Find a good job, work the good job, 40 hours a week, work the job, you know, the next 40 years of your life, then retire on 40% of the income. Right. And you always used to say, like, you basically just need to get a few properties to, re like, pensions nowadays, like, uh, several people I know who work, they're like, yo, when I retire, my yep. pension is going to be like 2,500, three grand. Yep. And that, consider where we come from, that's a, a, a fair pension. Yeah. But you got to really think about what inflation going, like, they told them that pension, when they started their job 15, right. 20 years ago. Yeah, prices are going up. So yeah, the price, the $3,000, which used to be 20 years ago, is, that might be $1,000 yeah. in today's time. Exactly, it's not the same. So when you talk about retirement buckets, you you literally, every property you get yep. is essentially- Your retirement bucket. You can get out of your job a lot sooner if you be aggressive with just- acquiring real estate. Exactly. When you look at Social Security, for instance, the average person on Social Security is getting about $1,200 a month. Yeah. So when you think about your expenses, how are you going to live off of $1,200 $1, a month when in actuality you could have one to two properties that are paying you that $1,200? And you can even pick up a property a year. And let's say your cash flow is at $700 every single uh, property yep. every single month, but over 10 years, you could pick up, say, 10 properties. And that's with hardly doing anything. You could pick up a property a year in your sleep. Yep. We actually teach people in the program how to pick up you know, multiple properties. Like, for instance, Janice has about four or five projects going on at one time. Wow. So imagine you having $700 of cash flow coming in every property. You just pick up one property every single year. Yep. 
So now you're in a situation where in 10 years you have $7,000 of extra income coming in. Wow. So you can keep doing whatever it is that you do for your day job, however you yep. put food on your table. But now you're in a situation where you have extra $7,000 coming in. Tenants are paying down that mortgage, paying down that note. So then when you do look up and it's time for retirement, you're in a situation where you have millions and millions of dollars where you could tap into. So you can either sell the portfolio, which I won't recommend yeah. because it's going to create a, a huge tax um, situation where you're going to pay you know, tons of taxes on that. But you can refinance that portfolio. So let's say the portfolio is worth $10 million at that time. Refinance it at 75%, pull out $7.5 million tax-free. This is money that you don't have to pay taxes on, mm. right? Or say you pass away, you pass that portfolio down to your children, restart the clock on the, on the, um, the mortgage payments. Mm -hmm. Mortgage payments still getting paid by the tenant. And now your kids look up 30 years, 40 years from now, assets are paid off. Now they can refinance that portfolio. Portfolio might be worth 15, 20 million by then. Yeah. Let me ask you this, because I know I'm, I'm probably getting ahead of myself, yeah. but I know you talk about this, and I'm curious to know. Um, I know you don't have any children yet, but what is the plan for, like, how you talk about we got 30, 40 years to um, think about it? Like, we, you keep a property for 30, 40 years and you die or whatever happens. I know yeah. you got the wills and the trusts. Well, I guess that kind of can govern it, but. Right. What if they just like, yo, I just want to get rid of the property? Like, yeah. like basically, how do you, how do you basically not encourage, but how are you training somebody to know like, yo, this is, yeah, you know, a lot of parents, like a lot of times you don't want to do what your parents did. So if right. they run in a certain business, you don't want to continue that business. Yeah. Certain, how do you, like, what would you do for your kids or whoever to say, yo, this is the plan. Like, this is what you need. Don't let go of this, these right. bricks. Like, make yeah. it important. Yeah, I think no matter what, if you have children, no matter what, never sell the bricks, right? Never sell the property because it's going to put you in a situation where they're going to be diminishing their wealth and they're going to be cutting their income streams, right? Yeah. So even if the kids do not care for real estate whatsoever, you know, I always recommend if you're still having kids, bring them around the real estate, bring them around the projects, right? Show them the cash flow, have them see the tenants, right? So that way they kind of plant that seed in their head. But let's say, for instance, they say, hey, listen, I want to be a doctor. I don't want anything to do with the real estate. You can actually set things in place. Like, for instance, you have a property manager yeah. that manages those properties. Mm -hmm. So now your kid's just getting a check every, every month, like clockwork. Yeah. So that way they could be hands off, hands free, and of course have someone to look at the numbers for them. Yeah. But if they don't want to look at the numbers, then you could put trustees in place. So that way now they're in a situation where trustees overlooking, making sure they're getting paid, making sure the property managing making sure the property management company is not running off with the check and so forth. But now they're in a, a position to continue to get cash flow, yep. continue to, be, to generate wealth. And now they're in a situation where they never go broke because they have these assets. So they can literally get paid nothing for years and years yep. during their day job where they just be out there traveling and trying to figure themselves out. But now they're in a situation where they have that cash flow, they have the assets yep. and they have wealth. Bro, it's so powerful because I just really wrapped up with my estate attorney and we were just planning adding to the will. And I'm like, it's crazy. Like I'm I'm giving all of my kids a certain amount of money every few years. Yeah. Of, but it's so crazy how much you can go. And it's new to me. I just, yeah. It's not something that we learn about wills, trusts, estates, board of trustees. Yeah. And I'm excited to know that all of that is together for me. And I continue get I can continue to update it as we acquire assets, but you basically can control how you want things to go after you die, which is... Right. Yeah, you put the whole plan in place, so now yeah. your kids are always going to eat forever. Because we play this game to eat forever. At the end of the day, the reason why I invest in real estate, because I want to eat forever, right? I never want to have to rely on another man to put food on my table. Yeah. And that's what I learned working at Corporate America, that at any moment, they literally can just pull the plug and say, you know what? Your time is up. Here's a box. Pack up your stuff. You have 15 minutes to you know, exit the building. Here's a security guard that could take you on out of here. So it was crazy, right? I went to University of Delaware, got a finance degree. But my first day at the job, Bank of America, right? It was, it was wild. So I'm in the elevator with HR. Got four other of my you know, coworkers, guys that just graduated University of Delaware. We get off the elevator, but there's literally this lady carrying this box, and she was in tears. She was probably about like 59, 60 years old. And I asked HR, I was like, hey, listen, like, why is she crying? She's like, oh, we just had massive layoffs, but don't worry, guys. We just had to make some room for the new guys. Yep. So, like, literally, this lady probably was making about $120,000 a year. Yep. And they literally just gave her the box to the point where they said, hey, we don't know what to tell you. Your time is up. Mm. So that kind of planted a seed in my head. It was like, they you know won. what? 
Yeah, day one, I was like, wow, this is crazy. Like, they're cutthroat. Like, she gave years and years of her life. She has a mortgage. She has kids in college. You know, she has bills to pay. And just like that, they just pulled the rug from under. Yeah. So I could, I, so I just, I felt like this can't be life, right? Mm -hmm. I worked four years in college just to get a degree, get a good paying job, corporate America. And I was expecting to work there till I was 65 and a half or 67 and a half. But just like that, they pulled the rug from under. So I, I knew from that moment that I never want to give someone else that much control ever. Yeah. So then I said, you know, I have to figure out how I can go ahead and get out of this death trap, if you will, yeah. immediately. Yeah. So that's why I started figuring out how can I go ahead and buy my first real estate property. Yeah. That's crazy, though, bro, because you probably would still be there if you didn't see that that day. Yeah, if I didn't see that, I probably would just been going along, get my three percent raises, you know, yeah. getting the pat on the back, getting the attaboys and so forth. Yeah. If I didn't see that, but I saw that, and then like after you see something like that, it's traumatizing yeah. almost. Like I, I probably got PSTD, you know, where I can't go back to corporate America yeah. because I remember what it was like seeing that lady in tears, a grown woman in tears, yeah. crying with a box in her hand, and she got a whole family to take care of. I mean, I, when I put myself in that position, I'll probably be crying too. Like you just yeah. you went in here thinking everything's great, and right. then you're. You're done. Done, just like that. It's like, uh, this has nothing to do with what we're talking about, but actresses and actors, they say when, essentially, when they get fired, yeah. when, when they get killed in the scene, yep. they tell them the day of. I mean, wow. the day before. Like, here's the script for tomorrow. Wow. Like, wow. basically, it's You're out of here. Yep. Like, so, ghosts. Like, yo, here's yeah. the script. Yeah, like, I'm going to cut your, your earnings yeah, out. Yeah, yeah you're which cut is, your money. That's a dangerous place to be in, bro. Yeah. Like, where somebody could just... And then, and then the crazy part is even like imagine we put our our you know our shoes on the lady's foot. Yeah. So imagine you got this box, you just got fired, and then they got some new talent that they're bringing in for a fraction of the cost to replace you. Yeah. Like that's that's detrimental, right? Yeah. So now what we think of younger okay, once, too, younger too yep. you know, faster, sharper, what have mm -hmm. you, and for a fraction of the cost. So now. For that one person, they're able to get two or three of us yep. working the same job and they're going to train us up and so forth. So now what's going to happen when we're working that same job 20, 30 years from now, right? When they bring that younger talent in, smarter, cheaper, yep. faster, mm -hmm. they're going to treat us the same way they treated the ladies. So that was a clear indication that that's not life. We yeah. can't go about life like that. Yeah, that's power. I'm happy you saw that because it changed that. And for me, one of my turning points was... And then I, you went similar, you had a similar situation going to these dope schools, but yeah. I got to see my friends. They, I'm a drug infested neighborhood. Yeah. And again, I know y'all, this had nothing to do with real estate. I know we're here <laughs> to talk about real estate yeah. and stuff, but I think it's it's powerful for people to start looking for opportunities or take certain things as signs. Like when I went to that school, right. 50 black kids out of a thousand, and I saw people have mansions and stuff. Yep. That was my sign or that seed planted that I believe awesome. that could be me. Yeah. When I worked at the private airport, my last job seeing millionaires and billionaires fly on private jets, the seed was planted that yep. that would be me. Yep. I've been on a hundred airplanes, yeah. hundred jets. That out. Yeah. But it's all it's seeds are powerful. So it's just like that's why it's so important for people to get in. I, I saw Janice, yeah. 16 properties, yeah. bro. Yeah, she's rolling. I remember, I remember. Tell Matter of fact, story yeah, about, tell a story. Yeah, you got to tell that story, yeah. bro. And then I want to go into helping people. Right. I want to help people get a seed planted on helping them buy their first or their got next it. property. Got it. Yeah. yeah, so it was crazy, right? So we do this thing called a ride along yep. where you literally could spend the whole day with me over 10 plus hours. You're yep. going to go to all my different projects. I'm breaking the game down to you from A to Z, mm -hmm. exactly how to go about finding the deal, funding the deal, yep. and even um, creating that cash flow that we're all looking for, right? And, and knowing how to do it yourself. Yeah. So there's this guy named Aaron, and Aaron wanted to attend my ride along, but he's actually was going to get scheduled to get married and so forth. But he couldn't bring it up to his wife because they were on a tight budget, and he's about to spend some you know substantial amount of money to learn the game of real estate. So they actually almost got divorced, man. Crazy. It was it was wild. So he he said, "Hey, I'm going to this guy Doug Depp's ride along." She's like, "Who the heck is Doug Depp? Like, how much does it cost? Like, no, you're crazy. If you go, this this is over. Yeah. We're not moving forward with our wedding." Yep. So guess what he did? He, he, went. he went anyway. Yeah. He went anyway. And it's probably the best decision in both their lives forever, right? If he didn't go, it could have went a different direction. Yeah. So he went to the ride along. And then he actually ended up, you know, he, he was one of those guys. He was literally by my hip. He was taking notes, copious notes, because he's like, listen, I can't fumble the bag, right? I went to this ride along. I got to absorb all this information so that way I can go ahead and execute on the information. Mm -hmm. 
So he went back to Janice and they still, they're married today, but they, Janice actually ended up surprising Aaron with my mentorship for his birthday. Wow. So that was just showed extra support. So when they get on to the mentorship and Janice is literally at every single call, like, you know, on camera, she's asking questions. She's very intuitive, but come to find out, she's sending me messages like, hey, what color paint do you use? What color floors? You know, she's, she's picking my brain to the fullest, yeah. but that's what she's supposed to do in a yeah. mentorship. Yeah. Like, that's how you get the most out of a mentor, yeah. Yeah. by asking questions, Question, right? Yeah. As many as you can. As many as you yeah. can, right? Because that way you're going to learn from a mentor's experience and it's going to fast put you on a fast pace to uh, go ahead and get your properties. So the crazy part is Janice and Aaron, they ended up having about 16 units they were able to run through in a quarter of, in about less than two years, they were able to pick up 16 units. And we talk about they got properties in Vegas, they got properties in New Jersey, they got properties in the Philadelphia area. But she was able to, they both were able to follow the plays to a T. That's what put them on the fast pass so that way they can go ahead and accumulate wealth. So literally they have accomplished more than what most people do in a lifetime in a short amount of time because they decide to invest in themselves. Great. But they decide to execute on the information because a lot of times people, they join mentorships, they read books, and it's entertainment for most people, right? Yeah. But it's until they actually execute and follow the exact steps, then they get results. Yeah. But you don't have to re reinvent the wheel. Yeah, that's a fact, bro. Like real estate, bro, like it's a couple things. One, they said they're not making no more land. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and everybody yeah. need a place to live. Yep. I don't care what happens with AI. Yep. I don't <laughs> care what happens with social media, yeah. with silicone vibe, yep. with the metaverse. Yeah. Like the one thing that stands true today is that real estate probably has created most a, a whole lot of millionaires. I mean, yep. probably one of the number one vehicle for creating multimillionaires in wealth. Yeah. But it's like, it will never be phased. Yo, listen, real estate has been around since, you know, the birth of Jesus, right? Yeah. For those that follow the story, you know, Mary needed a place to stay. She needed a major, right? The hotel was completely full. So they gave her a major. So she literally gave birth to Jesus and a major. But- there's real estate, right? So they actually had the whole apartment, the whole um, in the whole hotel already rented out, right? So the people are getting real estate money way back before Christ, essentially. So this game has been around forever and it's gonna be here to stay because like you said, everyone always needs a place to live. They literally can shut the internet down tomorrow and real estate will still be standing. Yeah, that's a fact, bro. It's just, it's powerful that people understand. Let me ask you because you said once you saw the job, um, you said I got to get in real estate. Was it another decision? What was it? How, why real estate and not stocks? Why not long care company? Right. Was it a a person or a thing that happened where you said it got to be real estate? Yeah, it was a few different things, right? Yeah. So I went to that private school, you know, yeah. kind of like how you went to a private school, yeah. and I wasn't one of the rich kids at all. Yeah. So, but I was around these folks. They had the beach houses, they had the the summer homes, they had the winter homes, the cabins. Parents had apartment buildings, they owned commercial real estate, and they were getting the Range Rovers at 16. They're getting the bar. I was going to the bar and bought mitzvahs. These was like parties that were $100,000 plus. But I was actually seeing and studying them. I became fascinated studying the rich, studying the wealthy, and I noticed that they all owned real estate, yeah. right? They had some form of real estate. So then I started just diving a little deeper as I got older. Um, I got this book, you know, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Mm -hmm. So that kind of broke down the classic. real estate game. It was a classic. So if you haven't read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, that's a must. Even The Richest Man of Bad Blind, my dad gave me that book back when I was in like seventh grade. Yeah. Didn't think anything of it because it was in crazy, you know, English language and so yeah. forth. I didn't quite get at that time. But so seeing them own real estate, owning properties, and just seeing what, how like wealth can actually be generated through that ownership, that's when I say, you know what? I got to get some real estate. And I knew that, if I could find something that provided cash flow without me having to trade my time for money, that's where I wanted to be, yeah. right? Because it's easy to go ahead and pick up a second job. Like a lot of people that are struggling, what happens? Their parents pick up a second job, a third job. They don't have any time for their friends or family uh, simply because they got to trade their time for money. But real estate allows you to go ahead and put your money to work for you. So that way you don't have to give your time and you can still have that money coming in every month. Powerful. So- Talk, let's talk to somebody who's here like, yo, Doug, all right, I'm convinced I need to go ahead and buy a property. Yep. I need to get me investment property. What would be the first step that you would tell somebody looking for investment property? Absolutely, absolutely. Always want to have, have good credit, right? The, 
the higher your credit is, the better you're going to be able to get, you know, loans, interest rates, and so forth. If you haven't used your first time home buyer um, advantage yet, like for instance, there's an FHA mortgage where you only need three and a half percent down, wow. right? So that's three and a half percent. So if the property is $100,000, you need uh, $3,500. And of course, there's closing costs and closing costs can be anywhere between two to three percent. So but, what's that, another two, three grand on? Yeah, another. If we use using 100,000. If we're using 100,000, that's another 3,000 on top. So yeah, now all together, 6,500 per $100,000. Yeah. But there's a one trick here, right? Yeah. So oftentimes, especially in a market like right now, it's not as hot as it once was. It's starting to cool off. So now we can go ahead and get something called seller concessions, hmm. right? So this is where the seller can actually help with those closing costs. If you were to get a FHA loan, you can go up to 6% of that, of that value, of that purchase price. So what does that mean? That's less money that you have to bring to the table, and you will go ahead and have the seller contribute that for you. So that's less money out of pocket. And the beautiful thing with this is the fact that, uh, the beautiful thing with the seller concession is the fact that, let's say if it is a competitive market, what do you do? People are fighting for the highest price, highest and best price. Let's say that price is 100000 But instead of giving an offer at 100000 you give an offer of 103500 bucks. Now you ask for $3,500 in seller concession, so you're still hitting that 100000 but now they're going ahead and they're giving you that uh, for less money you have to bring to the table. So now you're in a situation where you're able to step into a property, less money out of pocket, but the beautiful thing is you can get a single family property all the way up to a four unit uh, building. So for me, what did I do? I went ahead and got a single family property. I rented out every single room in that property, yeah. lived in my garage, you know, collected that cash flow. Were you aware of the duplexes, triplexes, and quad? No, when I first time? got started, I wasn't aware of the, the duplexes, triplexes. So you and recommend yeah. going multi from the very beginning? Yeah, from the rip, I recommend right. going the multi family with the FHA loan. Got it. Okay. Like, for instance, before I got married, I said, hey, Larissa, before we get married, you have to buy a property using the FHA loan. Yeah. And what did I recommend for her? A multifamily building. So got she it. was able to get a triplex, lived in the first floor unit, rented out the second. That triplex that we only had to put down less than ten thousand dollars. Wow, is now worth about four hundred and fifty thousand dollars. What you bought it for? She bought that one for ninety thousand. For ninety thousand. Ninety thousand. Dang. Put sixty thousand dollars worth of work. Okay, one fifty. One fifty is worth four hundred and fifty thousand now today. So, so appreciate an extra two hundred and fifty thousand. Correct. And would it make a month? Uh, so that one while we were living there. Yeah. So we're living for free, and we're still able to make extra about six hundred dollars a month. But then once wow. we moved out, we were able to make about $1,800 of cash flow from that one building. Wow. And, and, and let me, just so we're clear, is cash flow, just so anyone, yep. is that the difference after everything's paid or are you including that? That's the mortgage too. All right. So when we look at cash flow from a real estate standpoint, yep. we look at the revenue coming in. Mm -hmm. So the revenue is going to be the rents that they're paying. Yep. Then minus, you have some expenses. So you have your mortgage payment, mm -hmm. your interest payment. There's uh, taxes, there's insurance, yep. and then there's going to be maintenance on that property as well, mm -hmm. and then some vacancies. So that's going to, you subtract that from that revenue number, and that's going to give you the bottom line cash flow number. Mm -hmm. And that's how, that's cash so flow. So 1800 a month cash flow right now off yep. of that property that y'all bought however many years ago, yep. $150,000. Yeah. Ooh, that's crazy. So yep. so I, I, I want to go... Cause you said you you put sixty thousand into it. I still want to go back to the single yeah. family. I want people yep. to hear that, but yep. I want them to. Cause is that the FHA two hundred three k with that way? Right. Talk yeah. about that. Just yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So, so for those powerful. that are, so the key with real estate, the best way you really get ahead is finding undervalued properties. Yeah. Right. So when you find these undervalued properties, like for instance, uh, the property that we found for my wife. Was an undervalued property at ninety thousand dollars. So with the FHA program, you still only have to put down that three and a half percent. Plus, there's closing costs and so forth. However, the construction of that property, you know, putting it back together to today's standards, is a hundred percent covered inside of that same loan. So now you're able to find these undervalued properties, fix them up, rent them out, and now you have a low mortgage payment every single month with a little bit of money out of pocket. Wow. That's good. So go back to the single. So your yep. first thing was just single family. I'm going to talk us through that. Yeah. Yep. So it got the single family. It was three and a half percent down. And uh, Obama gave me an $8,000 tax credit. But in today's standards, they actually have uh, different seller assistant programs or first time home buyer programs that'll give you um, grants to go ahead and go toward the purchase of your property. So if you're anywhere in the country, one thing that you want to do 
is all go right online and put in first time home buyer grants. So put that right into Google. And now you're in a situation where you can actually have additional funds to go toward the purchase of your first property. Hey, sorry to stop the episode. I know you're probably wondering, Neil, I always see you with that brand on. How can I be a part of it? How can I get the official gear of every entrepreneur in the world? What I need you to do is go to newaceos.com so you can get your gear. We got something for women. We got something for men. We got something for spring. We got something for fall. We got something for winter. We want to make sure you have the official gear of every entrepreneur in the world. Go to newaceos.com. So, so quick, and go to Google, and should you ask realtors and stuff for always what are the current programs and stuff like that? Exactly. Well? So one thing, whatever realtor you're working with, see what first-time home buyer programs they have and what capital they have to go toward helping you with that first purchase. Got it. So with that FHA loan, what I did was bought that first property 3.5% down. Obama gave $8,000 tax credit, and this was money that I had saved up and that I was investing because uh, the name of the game is is living below your means and, and saving up capital. But I was able to tap into those funds, put the three and a half percent down, eight thousand dollars tax credit uh, back. So I bought this single family property, four bedrooms, three and a half baths, rented out every single room, mm. right? And then I had additional cash. So one thing that people do is, when you get that extra cash flow coming in, like I think I had an extra sixteen hundred dollars, give or take, of cash flow coming in, living in that property where I was renting all the rooms out. Most people go ahead and increase their lifestyle. So you get an extra $1,600, what are you gonna do? Are you gonna increase your lifestyle or are you gonna go ahead and stay down and continue to put that money to the side to get ready for the next investment, the next income uh, producing investment so that we can have that cash flow and get you out of your current nine to five situation. Because mm. at the end of the day, I don't wanna be stuck hugging the cubicle. And that's what I knew after seeing that person holding that box, I said, I don't wanna be stuck hugging the cubicle. So I didn't go ahead and get a new watch, I didn't get a new car. I didn't go ahead and do a bunch of traveling or anything like that because I said, I have to get out of this, this rat race immediately. Yeah, yeah. that's good. Mm, mm, mm. So, Renna, what was the, is that considered house hacking? Yeah, like, so that, that's house hacking. Tell people. This is house hacking and then I want to put extreme by it, right? Most people don't want to go ahead and live and in the garage. And before you go, yeah. I want y'all to really catch what's happening right now. Yeah. Just gave you a house hacking play which you're about to go on. Showed you how to buy the property using FHA. Showed you another way to do it using a tool 3K. I hope y'all getting through. I'm 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 trying to do surgery on this brain, y'all, so y'all can go figure out how to go ahead and grab you a property, man. Your first or your next, because it only takes you to see one and be like, yo, I'm hooked. But yeah. 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 So my house hacking was a house hacking extreme, Got right? It. So I took every single bedroom. I was even trying to figure out how I could take the living room, put up a wall, and yeah. add an additional fifth bedroom. Yeah. But what I did was rented out every single room. And when I bought the properties, four bedroom, three and a half baths, but I had a two car garage. Mm -hmm. so literally, I was living up in the king bed, and that's a whole nother story. But I was, I was living up on the king bed um, in the master with the king bed. I moved that king bed right down to the garage. Yeah. And I was just in there living, and my roommates, you know, they thought I was crazy. Like, yeah, yo, yeah. why is this guy living yeah, in the garage? He's got a good job. He's got a car, yeah. you know, but they didn't understand the long-term vision. Yeah. So it's often times where we have to be willing to sacrifice right now mm -hmm. for the long-term gain. Short-term sacrifice, long-term gain. My short-term sacrifice was I was willing to live in the garage. I was willing to save up my capital. I was willing to cut out, you know, watching LeBron play. I was willing to cut out going out to parties. I was willing to cut out travel because I knew that long-term, I wanted to be free, right? And I put that price tag on my freedom where I was had to you know, sacrifice these things. And I knew that freedom was the bigger goal for me. Yeah, that's good. That's powerful right there, bro. It's just when you set, and I, I know your personal story, you slept in a garage for a couple years. Yeah. What, like, I feel like you got to become, I'm not telling nobody to sleep in a garage. Right, right, what, right. I know I'm hearing the freedom, the wealth, but was there another switch that happened that made you say, yo, I'm going... You did house hacking to the extreme. Right. You lived in a garage winter months, summer months. Yeah. Like, like is it is it a thing where you like, yo, the money is so important for me to wealth? Like, what? Right. I'm trying to figure out how can people start going extreme in everything that they do. Not yeah. not saying that they got to go to your level, but I feel as though a lot of people aren't getting to the level they want because they come up with too many excuses and they don't have. What is your burning desire? Like, what was, yeah. what was or is that burning desire? Is it? 
I, th- I think one of my my burning desires, right, was uh, you know, I watched my parents work very hard, put a lot of hours in, yeah. and you know, I, I watched them lose a lot of money as well. And I said, man, like if they just had real estate, they always would have had assets. They always would have had additional cash flow without having to put that time and energy in. You know, my father has Alzheimer's as as well, so it's like, man, if he just had those assets. But I think some of that was was you know that burning desire where. I want to be in a situation where no matter what happens, say, you know, I might not have my health. I want to be in a situation where I always have that cash flow coming in. And also, uh, one of the burning desires was the fact of, you know, that traumatizing experience of seeing that lady carrying that box. Because I remember my mom actually got laid off in the finance industry, right? She was a financial analyst. She got laid off. And I remember how that, how we felt in the household at that time, where it's like, man, I can never have this happen. So I was willing to do whatever it takes. Right. And, it, you know, as you always say, it has to work or it has to work. So I, I literally was right there in the garage and every single day, you know, I would just say, you know, I have to put in this work. I have to go ahead and sacrifice. I have to study because I wanted more for more out of life. Right. I've seen too much. I've been in situations where I've seen the kids getting the private jets, the limo service, the big houses, the nice things in life. All I wanted was freedom and I wanted my time. Yeah, that's good, man. I just want people to really dig deep and identify why you need to make this happen. Like put, put aside the materialism, right. put aside anything that is not, don't do nothing until you start building assets up that can right. pay for those things. Exactly. No, that's big. It's, it's a critical move. So we went to the house. All right, we went to the house. What's our next step? So we 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 just purchased a property using FHA. We just purchased a, we talked about the tool 3K. So I'm assuming you need to get your spouse on board with this. Right, correct. How was you able to get your spouse on board where you're like, yo, we need yeah. to go do this? Because yep. somebody right now, I believe, there's two people in the household oftentimes. Like, what yep. if you can get your spouse to go buy a prop? Like, mm-hmm. you could start developing wealth. Right, no, for sure, for sure. So when I met my wife, uh, Larissa, I was actually living in the garage. And so that was the biggest test, right? Yeah. I'm, a, I'm not a flashy guy. Yeah. I'm not going to go ahead and spend all this money because I, I'm not going to keep that up, right? Yeah. You know, I, I'm very frugal if you... Uh, get a chance to meet me. Yeah. But she understood the vision. She understood I was working late, putting these projects together. But when, he, when I got, we got engaged, she, was, she saw the work ethic, right? So it's one thing to go ahead and study, put in the work, uh, study and say, oh, I'm going to go ahead and do real estate. But you're coming home, you're sitting on the couch. You're coming home, you're grabbing a beer, you're watching a game, but you're still telling your significant other, oh yeah, I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to hit it big in real estate but you're not actually showing and putting in the work day in and day out. So I think that was a big thing for me where I was saying, I'm going to build this real estate empire. We're going to retire early and so forth, but I put that action behind it. So it was a lot easier for a spouse or someone, a significant other of yours to see that if you're putting in the work, if I didn't put in the work, then it's just another, you know, dream in the sky, what have you. So it's very important to have a spouse that is on your team. But one thing, for instance, I had a relationship before I met Larissa, where I bought the house, but she didn't have the vision. And I saw she didn't have the vision and she didn't want to get on board. Therefore, we had to go our separate ways, you know, gave her the two-week notice and yeah. so forth. That's a story for another day. But when you have when you have that spouse that has that vision and believes in you, now you can go ahead and go a lot further. Tell me about the two-week notice. Uh, I, yeah. I know I heard it, but I feel like people, yeah. people need to hear it because some people are with people, bro, who... You just shouldn't be with them, bro. Right. There is no growth in some of these relationships. Yeah. Some of the people are spending too long with people who yeah. just don't get it. Yeah. yeah. First and foremost, life is short, right? So Facts. that's the first and foremost. Yeah. So we you know we don't have second chances, you know. But the two week notice worked like this. So we bought the I bought the four bedroom, three and a half bath property. Um, my significant other at that time, my girlfriend at that time, was living in the property with me. But I said, you know what? We have all these rooms. I want to rent these rooms out. I don't want to pay the mortgage. So she's like, oh, no, you're crazy. Like, you know, what do you mean you don't want to pay the mortgage? I don't want any strangers living in this property. So, you know, I had some some rules I had to follow. So I couldn't have a lady in the property living in this property that was, you know, our age. I couldn't have a creepy old man living in the property. I couldn't have a guy our age living in the property, right? That wouldn't be right. So what did I have to do? I went on Craigslist. I found this retired grandmother to actually live in the property. So we had a, on the first floor, they had, she had her own bathroom. So she rented out the property for $750 uh, for the month. And then I came back one day and I said, you know what? I want to rent out these other rooms. We still have two more rooms left. I don't want to pay anything. Now I'm yeah. cut the mortgage in half. But I don't want to pay anything. She's like, Doug, you're tripping. You're crazy. There's no way 
he wanted to just fill his house up with, with these random people. So I thought about it. And I thought about my goals, and I thought about like, man, I'm not working this nine to five. Like, I have to think of something to to make this extra money. So then I asked her a question. I said, Hey, listen, do you want to be rich or do you want to be poor? Mm. She thought about it for a second. She said, You know what? I'm okay being poor. Wow. So that kind of that kind of blew my mind, right? I I couldn't even say anything right after that. I got in the car, went to work. I'm like, okay, being poor. I just kept saying, okay, being poor. I was like, no, nah, I'm not okay being Mess poor. Your up. Yeah, it messed my whole mental up. It was like, how can you be okay being poor when there's people getting the private jets, the limo service, you know, they're renting out Allen Iverson for birthday parties and so forth. So I wasn't okay with that. You know, I did call my brother and I said, hey, yo, bro, like she's okay being poor. My brother's like, just ride that thing out. He's been locked up for a long time. Yeah, so, you yeah, know, yeah. he's like, <laughs> but uh, that's another story as well. But okay being poor. So I came back and I said, hey, listen, it's not gonna work. So I gave her a two week notice. I said, you got two weeks, pack up everything. You know, there was a lot of tears. We were dating for three, you know, over three years. We wow. were dating while in college and so forth. But I had to draw the line in the sand where I wasn't okay being poor. Mm. So I gave her that pink slip, gave her that two week notice that, hey, listen, not going to go, in, this relationship's not going in the direction I needed to go in. Because if you're okay being poor and I had, you know, I had these high dreams, you're okay being right here, staying where we're at, complacent, you think we made it, that's not going to work. So uh, she got two week notice, a lot of tears involved, but two weeks came up, two guys moving up the stairs. They moved into the two bedrooms across the hall. And then I said, you know, now I'm single, got this, you know, nice, you know, huge bedroom with the walk-in closet, soaking tub, shower, yeah. balcony, all yeah. that good stuff, yeah. living the life. Yeah. I said, I don't even need all this. Right. I took that king bed down to the garage, lived in the garage, sub-zero sleeping bag when it got cold, but I was willing to do whatever it took to go ahead and have that freedom and mobility because I knew that it was obtainable because I've seen it. Yeah. Golly. Yeah. Bro, people can understand that, that that is a level of extreme, bro. Yeah. Like, listen, three years with somebody, yo, we ain't on the same page. Yeah. How do we say somebody, what, what conversation needs to be had today with somebody significant other to get on the wealth train? Yeah. Like, what, what are you talking? What, uh, what are you saying to them? I think is I think it's very important to let them know your goals, right? Yep. And and to be able to draw that line in the sand and be like, hey, listen, my goal is to be wealthy. My goal is to have freedom. My goal is to have that mobility, and seeing where their head is, right? Yeah. If they're and you could tell very very quickly if someone is supportive or if they're more negative. If you're like, oh, you're you're doing that thing again, or they calling you, they're hounding you. Where you at? Why you why are you working so hard? I need more time with you. Yep. But if you're really trying to build. Um, an empire, you're really trying to build something, then your significant other is going to be able to understand. So it's very important that you sit down and you have that conversation like, hey, listen, these next three, four years is going to be tough. It's going to require a lot of my time, a lot of my energy. Yeah. Are you on board? Mm -hmm. My goal is to for us to be, be wealthy. My goal is to have the freedom and the mobility. Yeah. Are you willing to stay down with me? Are you willing to sacrifice, you know, going on these five-star trips? Are you willing to, you know, not going out to eat every single night? Are you willing to, to save and, and to uh, stack up and to invest our funds and time and energy? Yeah. And if they say no, then you have to make that tough decision, right? Because I'm not real big on trying to change people. Mm -hmm. Like I could show you, but, if, but uh, if you're not there, I'm not willing to just dumb down my living situation, dumb down my lifestyle, dumb down my goals for someone else. Hey, thank you so much for tuning in this episode. I hope you're getting an extreme amount of value. I want you to go ahead and comment below, share with me your biggest takeaway. In addition to that, my number one goal is for me to be able to grow all of my social platforms so I can give you info, insight, strategy, and gain from every platform there is. So take a minute to follow me on Instagram, at Neil So same exact name on Twitter, same exact name on TikTok, and follow me on LinkedIn, at Nehemiah Davis. I would love for you to be able to be tuned into my article and everything that I drop relating to helping you get to that next level in your life. Tune in. That's good. That's powerful. Like, if it, yo, anybody listen, like, really had this conversation because some people you're with way too long and they, they're not on, they're, they're not here for the long haul. Right. So I think people really got to understand that. It's yeah, it's, it's very, very important. I know you always talk about auditing your circle, audit your relationships, audit your significant other. Like, do you really see yourself with this person in the next six months, next year? next five years, right? You know, how they manage money, what are their spending habits like? Because you could be an extreme uh, frugal saver, investor, but this other person then go ahead and spends all the money, so that relationship's not gonna go where it needs to go unless you guys get some counseling and really get on the same page. Yeah, that's good, that's powerful. So 
we, we're, we're learning how to buy our first property. We just showed you how to grip up one with your significant other as yeah. well. Um, I want to go to another level. Like, what is my next step? How am I How am I able to grow my portfolio five, yeah. ten properties oh, a yeah. year? Like, Janice, you said she did 16 properties in a year. I know Eli, I believe, he did another maybe three, four properties in yeah. a year. Like, is that yeah, through Ariel, refinance? Ariel like, did, like, 10, 10 units plus. Like, yeah. yeah. So walk me through, like, what is my next step to yeah. go I said, house acquiring extreme, I guess? Yep, yep, yep. So I think one of the things is you got to develop a team. Yeah. So developing the team, I break the team very simple. There's three different main team members. There's the acquisition team. Yep. There's the construction team. Then there's the property management team. Okay. But when you're looking at acquiring properties, one of the biggest things that you want to do is being able to analyze what a good deal is versus a bad deal. Mm, Oftentimes good. people just want to go ahead and jump into real estate, but they don't even know if it's a good deal or a bad deal. And they find themselves in a bad situation where you literally could lose the shirt off your back. Like real estate deals with a lot of zeros, a lot of thousands of dollars. So if you just jump in there just willy nilly, you can end up drowning. Yeah. So we don't want that to happen. So one of the biggest things that I teach is how to analyze that deal. And I believe strong wholeheartedly in the 65% rule. So what does that mean? That means that we can only, the purchase price as well as construction of a property can only be 65% of the ARV, the after repair value. Okay. So let's say, for instance, we have a property worth $100,000. Mm -hmm. Then we want to be all in from the purchase and construction, $65,000. This is very, very important. Yeah. And when people fray from this rule, they find themselves in the hole. They yeah. find themselves losing money. They find themselves losing their shirt. Yeah. So that 65% rule, if you don't remember anything else, remember the 65% rule. So now from a purchase standpoint and a construction, we want to be all in 65%. So once you know how to analyze these deals, you're going to want to build your acquisitions team. So your acquisition team, what does that consist and, and of? And before you get there, you mentioned yeah. the ARV. Tell, yeah. tell everybody what that is. Right. So, so the is. ARV is the after repair value. So how are you going to get the ARV? One, you're going to have um, comparables. So you're going to look at what properties are selling for in your general area that are fixed up. So in, right, so let's say, for instance, you have a single family property um, and the ARV is $200,000. How do we know that? We're looking at what comparable sales of properties that look like, what your property is going to look like in that area, right? So sometimes, depending on your neighborhood and so forth and how appraisals, appraisers will go ahead and get that ARV to after repair value. They're going to go ahead and look either a quarter mile, half mile to a mile within that radius of your property. So that way they can find those comparables, give you that ARV, after repair value. So that's a huge calculation. Next, purchase price. Purchase price is huge because we want to make sure that with that purchase price, what they're asking for is going to fit that 65% rule. So I have a calculator that I actually created yeah. just for my students. So now they can analyze these deals in literally seconds. It takes less than 60 seconds to analyze if it's a good deal or a bad, bad deal. deal. That's good. And that construction Powerful. is huge because you we got to fix these properties up. So there's different costs with construction. There's, you know, if it's um, a light rehab, moderate rehab, full rehab, or even new construction. So we need to know how to plug these numbers in. And I have another calculator for that as well. It makes it very simple. So even if you don't know how to you know, add things up and use math, I make it so simple for you that all you have to do is key in some key numbers. So now you're in a situation where you can say, okay, good deal or bad deal. And even you know, in the calculator, it says good deal or bad deal, literally. So once we know how to analyze these deals, next we have to build our acquisition team. What does that consist of? So we're going to need our wholesalers. So these are folks that are actually going out, finding the motivated sellers, right? We want them on our team because they're going to be able to bring deals to us, right? We need yep. that deal flow. Mm -hmm. We also need realtors. One way to find some realtors, go to realtor.com, type in the zip code of where you want to invest in, and they're going to give you the top realtors within that area. And they'll even tell you the price range that these realtors specialize in. So that's very important. So now we're building up our team. We've got the wholesalers. we got the realtors. And you can go ahead and build your, your own wholesaling team where you're actually reaching out to motivated sellers. Like, for instance, you can go to PropStream and you can find motivated sellers right on PropStream. Look for out-of-town uh, landlords, people that have owned property for you know, over five years and also have significant equity in that property. So you can go to PropStream to find these if you want to go ahead and build your wholesale team you know, out from scratch. Yep. But I prefer this to go ahead and keep it simple, tap into the wholesalers, tap into the realtors, and go to you know, Zillow. And that's leverage. So, you letting somebody leverage. do what their skill set is it, versus you trying to learn. I'm not going to yeah. learn how to be a wholesaler. Right. There's exactly. nothing wrong with that if you want to yeah. be a specialist. You, you wholesale. You yeah. know how to do that. But yeah. 
you got a lot of people sending you deals every day. Yeah, I'd rather instead of me spend my time, energy, and effort to make, you know, when I could just pay someone five thousand dollars, ten thousand, twenty thousand dollars on a deal to bring yep. it to me, and it still makes sense, and I'm still analyzing the deal. I'll take that any day because my time is so valuable that I'll rather just give me the deal, let me analyze very fast. I can say yes or no yep. and keep things moving because my job is to buy as many cash flowing assets as possible. Yeah, right. Awesome. So that's my goal. So with that, we build our acquisition team. We also need some lenders in place. So once you get past the FHA loans and so forth, you want to go ahead and move to the next level. I always recommend getting hard money or short term lenders on your team. So what is what's a hard money lender? This is someone where you only have to put down 10 to 20 percent of the purchase price. And they'll cover the remaining 80 or 90 percent and then they'll cover 100 percent of the construction. So now you're in a situation where you only have to come out of pocket a small amount of money. and They're going to go ahead and fund you, give you the funding necessary to go ahead and fix that property up. So once it's fixed up, we'll go ahead and refinance that property, get our money back, pay off the short term lender. And now we're in a situation to collect that rent month in and month out. And we continue to duplicate this process over and over and over again. So we're going to need a good lender on our team. So there's going to be a couple hard money lenders. And also we want to go to some small community banks. Like for instance, I have a lot of properties in Coatesville. So I was investing with uh, Coates or I was using Coatesville Savings Bank, which is now Prosper Bank. And they were able to give me you know, great rates, great terms. And these were commercial loans. I would literally bring them a deal. They'll be able to fund it within 30 days, but they were on my team, right? So it was very important that we had that on that acquisition team. We got the people bringing us deals, the people that are funding those deals for us. And then we're going to need a good title company as well. So it was funny. Uh, one of the members in the uh, acquisition execution mentorship, they posted a question right within our Facebook group. And they said, hey, I'm looking at some properties in Baltimore. This wholesaler actually wants to um, sell me the property. He wants to sign the prop, you know, sign the contract. But also he wants them to go ahead and wire the wholesaler money. Yeah. So he said, does this a good idea? How can I check to see if this wholesale is legit? Never, ever, never, ever wire any funds to the seller mm -hmm. or to a wholesaler. Mm -hmm. That's going to get you jammed up. And that's going to get you scammed. Like it's literally a wholesaler or a seller is going to take the money and disappear on you nine times out of ten. So always deal with a title company or a lawyer, right? Give them the contract. And then whatever is in the contract, if the down payment, the escrow money is $5,000, you're going to give that to the title company or the lawyer. Because let's say, for instance, that title is not free and clear. That's going to put you in a situation to get your money back where let's say the title is not free and clear and you even go ahead and purchase that property. You're going to be in a situation where when it comes time to refinance that property, you're not going to be able to because it has a bad title. Mm. And let's say, for instance, that title is bad. That title company will help you get your earnest money back in your pocket opposed to that person's pocket and then you're playing the phone game yeah. and they disappeared on you. Mm. So look, I, I want to take a small shift. Yeah. I need to hear some more real estate no-nos. I felt right. like that was one like, oh, yeah. don't don't send your money to somebody I need to go to a title company. Yeah. Is there anything else that there's some no-nos that oh, yeah. a beginner is doing, There, yeah. there's no-nos that even some advanced people are doing that can cause yeah. you to, like you said, lose your shirt. Yep. And I don't know, you know, we talk about it all the time, like this is a game where one bad mistake can cost you 10000 50000 100000 oh, yeah. And you made one of those mistakes, I believe, in one of your first, one of your first deals. You almost was, talk about, you oh, almost oh, yeah. was out of the game with oh, yeah. one of your first situations. Yeah, one of my first jobs where I was going, because before I was buying properties that were turnkey, I was getting yeah. them foreclosure, foreclosures. Literally just had to just put some paint and it was ready, moving ready. But I was yeah. getting them at such a deep discount, 50 cents on the dollar, that I was able to go ahead and pick these up pretty quickly with a small amount of money out of pocket. Yeah. So one of my first deals where it was a complete disaster. I'm talking about the roof was missing, the back of the house was missing. So it was a complete like full out, my first full out gut renovation of a property where I had a contractor, we were under contract for about $75,000. And I had, I had cash at the time. So he's like, hey, hey, Doug, you know, Go ahead and give me cash to get started. So I gave him a, a significant amount of money of cash to get started. And as Which you normally never do, right? Normally never do. Never, never so give. So you went against kind of your, your I principles. went against my principles. What made you go against your principles at that time? Uh, it was because it was a new experience. And Got I it. am somewhat of a risk taker as Got well, it. but calculated yeah. risk. Mm -hmm. So this, I, wanted, I knew I wanted to get into the full gut renovation jobs, right? And I knew that, okay, I have the capital and we're just going to go ahead and try out this new way of, of doing things. 
because uh, the guy said, hey, if you got the capital, no point in going ahead and getting a loan to do the construction and so forth. So as we're rolling through this, this project, I'm giving thousands of thousands of dollars in cash. We're rolling. The demo is done really fast. The framing is done really fast. But then I noticed that the contractor got ahead of the payment. So most of the money is in the contractor's hand and less of the money is in my pocket, but not all the work is, has been done. I trusted that the contractor was going to go ahead and move through this project very quickly, but that didn't happen. There's a tons and tons of excuses that took place. You know, it was big tank weekend. It was the Pope was in town. There was a lot of different things going on, birthday parties and so forth, but the job didn't get done. And it took almost two years for that job to get complete. So I had over $70,000 of my hard earned cash tied up in this project with an incomplete project. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that you never want to do is get, get ahead of the payments, right? You don't want that contract to get ahead of the payments. You always want you always want to be ahead of the payments yourself. So you always want that contract to be calling you for that next payment mm. opposed to the other way around. Cause there's contracts that, you know, in the word contractors is con. Mm. These guys are professional con artists, a lot of them. <laughs> so you can get in a situation where your money can go right to this con tractor. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. But uh, you never want to put yourself in that situation. So there's, so there's reasons why one, I want to teach all of my students in that, that in the A&E program, they had the steps of construction. So now yeah. we can break down when people should get paid, yeah. right? And how much to pay people. So let's say, for instance, there's you know, five different stages of construction. For each of those stages, we want to break those payments down into thirds. Mm -hmm. We can even go a little deeper. Let's say we're doing the plumbing roughing, where you're just putting all the pipes, the drain lines, the water lines, the supply lines throughout a property. And let's say the bill is... Uh, ten thousand dollars, right? Yep. For that, for that roughing, just hypothetically, we want to pay that contractor a third, you know, up front to get started to get some materials. And this is if they're buying materials. If you're buying materials, they they're not getting paid until they actually start some work. Mm. But let's just say they're buying the materials. We're gonna pay them a third up front, then another third uh, payment, progress payment when they're just about at completion. Then you're gonna pay them a completed, you know, third. So that's once it's completed. If you have permits, inspector coming in, they go ahead and inspect the project. And once everything checks out, then they'll go ahead and get that final third, that payment. Mm -hmm. So that way it totals out to be that $10,000. But it's very, very important that we develop these payment uh, plans for a contract. Because oftentimes what will happen, and it had to happen to me, let's say you have a contractor, he looks at the big project. Okay, it's a $100,000 project. Yep. I need a third up front. Mm -hmm. What's a third of $100,000? That's $33,000 going in this contractor's hand. Wow. What's going to happen most of the time? Contract is going to disappear. Yeah, facts. Anyway, I just made $33,000. I didn't have to show up. All I did was put together a piece of paper. Yeah. Good luck catching me. Mm. Right? So that's, that's the biggest thing, that how contractors are running off of the money, because you're giving up too much up front. Right? You're trusting the contract, contractor too much up front. And then by the time you pay legal fees and try to track down that contractor, they're gone, and you're going to spend way over that amount of money just trying to find that contractor. <sighs> So that's, so that's a big thing, right? So that's why it's so important to build up your team. Uh, so you build up your acquisition team. You got your, your lenders, your people that bring you deals. You got your title company. You also have a good lawyer in place, right? So that's part of your acquisition team. There's a couple other people that you need on your acquisition team, but that's the core. Then you're going to need your con uh, construction team. So this consists of you know, your subcontractors as well as your contractors. If you don't want to be your own general contractor yourself, mm -hmm. build up your construction team. You know, a list of all the people that are going to get the job done for you. And then you're going to need that property management team. That property management team is going to be the team that's going to actually manage the property and see that you get the most cash flow out of that property. Wow. Ooh. Yo, when I say you going hard, it's, yeah, a, listen. it's a master class, it's a, it's right? A master this thing class. is a, a symphony right now. Like, right. y'all, real, I got to just plug this. If y'all are listening to this, man, and y'all are truly interested in real estate, I don't do this on any episode. Make sure y'all tap in with Doug, y'all. I'm telling you, this dude is the real deal, breaking this game down so you could get wealthy.